Good morning. At this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording started. Thank you. Floor recording started. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you and good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Economic Development. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Vallone. We are ready to begin. Uh, excuse me one second, Sergeant Sadowski. Can we pause for a minute? It just looks like uh, uh, we should need to double check the stream. I don't see it engaged on my end. Okay, just let me know when you guys are clear. We're checking on it now, sir. We'll let you know right away. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Chief Sergeant Torrance Rafael Perez. Uh, please bear with us. We should be starting shortly. We have a small technical issue that should be resolved in a couple of minutes. Uh, we should be starting uh, pretty soon. Thank you so much.
How are we looking, guys? Everyone's got tight schedules today. We're working on it, sir. We should have it uh, starting out shortly. We just having an issue with the stream. Want to make sure that every member of the public is able to view the hearing. All right, so let me know. Yes, sir. and other partners to facilitate the continued operation of the central function of the criminal justice system and bring cases to conclusion. Last year, in March 2020, as in-person operations decreased due to the pandemic's health mandates, OCA, MACJ, and other partners worked together around the clock to implement virtual essential operations. Within two weeks, arraignments and other court appearances were entirely virtual while core employees continue to report to the courthouse to perform the essential tasks that help to maintain the system. Throughout the pandemic, as guidelines and requirements shifted as a result of the dynamic nature of the pandemic and the COVID emergency that we face, in-person operations from grand juries to trials resume and have reduced capacity. MACJ worked with the various core actors to coordinate COVID-19 mitigation measures at each phase of the public health emergency. My office partnered with DCAS and OCA to, sur to survey the ventilation capacity of the courthouses. In coordination with OCA, DCAS provided portable air filter filtration units for spaces where ventilation was limited, installed plexiglass, sorry, plexiglass in all areas that require close interaction implemented enhanced cleaning measures through the buildings and installed COVID-19 best practices signage, such as physical, physical distancing, face coverings, and hand washing in public areas. MACJ worked with the Department of Health and Mental uh, Health uh, to clarify the screening guidelines and processes for reporting and handling contact tracing. MACJ also helped to plan the for the resumption of some in-person operations, including grand juries, grand juries to deliberate on felony indictments, and some criminal jury trials. In order to mitigate the risk of exposure to and transmission of COVID-19, the city obtained at-home COVID-19 tests for in-person staff. Understanding that the vaccine is our most critical tool in protecting us and the communities in which we live, from severe COVID-19 illness, hospitalization, and death. The city worked with health agencies to confirm vaccine eligibility for various core actors before vaccinations were open to all adults. We work with the courts and other safety and system actors to facilitate vaccines to their employees in different ways. I would like to outline now some of the progress that we have made today from a quantitative perspective. But first, I would like to make a vital point. As the mayor has stated since the summer of 2020, in-person court operations are critical to the overall functioning of the criminal justice system and to the deterrence of violent criminal conduct. Virtual operations are important and they have sustained us through the difficult days of the pandemic by facilitating some essential functions, but nothing can fully replace in-person operations. To work efficiently and fairly unfairly I state, the adversarial criminal justice system must operate in person. Jurors and grand juries might be, must be able to meet to hear evidence and determine whether criminal charges should be brought. Similarly, the accused is entitled to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury and to be confronted with the witness against him. To protect the due process that our constitutional laws afford to all of us, there is no other way to do this than in person. The courts are now well on their way to being back to full in-person operations. And the city is working with our partners to make sure that the volume of work in all the stages return to pre-pandemic levels this summer. In April, 2021, the mayor put forth a comprehensive plan to end gun violence, safe summer near NYC, with courts being one of three areas of focus along the communities and cops. The city is and will continue to do everything possible to support a, a fully functional justice system. We are currently seeing some positive trends that show that the criminal process has returned or is fast returning to pre-pandemic levels as the courts continue to increase in-person appearance. 
I will not read them. They are part of the record. They're part of our dependence testimony that you have. We are also seeing that there is a significant backlog and we believe the full resumption of in-person appearances and consistent system coordination will help to address. Again, please see the appended list of relevant system-wide data on arraignments, indictments, pleas, sentencing, as well as a case backlog and time in custody to measure and to show a, the signs of progress that we see in the system. I thank you very much for the opportunity to share a small portion of our work during the pandemic, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Director Solar. I'd like to acknowledge that we've also been joined by Council Member Rosenthal. Director Solar, um, in, in dealing with the backlog and in speaking about the backlog, according to data from OCA, there are over 49,000 criminal cases pending in the city's courts. That number isn't terribly unusual, but the number of pending misdemeanors is way down, though the increased backlog is made up largely of felonies. For example, in Manhattan, there are 4,130 pending Supreme Court cases in 2020, as compared to only 3,437 in 2019. Those are the most serious cases for both victims who want to see justice and for defendants who are incarcerated while they wait for trial. What can you tell us about the plan to reduce the backlog? Thank you. This is a very important question, as you know, and I, as you have well indicated, when we compare it to historical moments, we have seen obviously high numbers, particularly in misdemeanors and also in felonies. For instance, last year, prior to the pandemic, we'd have about 15,000 case felony cases in the system. Most of them were, a, were both indicted and knowing that right now we have 24, about 24,000 felonies. What we are doing is the following. Number one, is we are working very closely with the courts and uh, with the district attorneys, and they can expand on these, on expanding the number of grand juries. In order to do that, we need to do that, creating safe conditions. What we need to do is to find the space and allow us to do that, social distancing and other measures, facilitate vaccinations that I indicated. Grand juries is, are essential. Right now, we have about 9,500 a felony cases that are indicted, but there is a, a substantial number of them which need to be indicted. I think the number is about 14,000. So certainly our priority is to work with the DAs to make that possible. The other thing that we are working very closely is similarly a, to make sure that we facilitate a trials. The city obviously does not run the process, but works very closely with, again, with course of the DAs and defenders to make sure that those trial rooms are up and running, we think is absolutely essential. We saw, for instance, very recently in certain borders and there was limited room and we worked very effectively, I think, with a, the courts to make sure that there was an expansion of the number of trial rooms. I also think that it's important that we have agreed with the courts a, and the defenders as well as, a, a, as the DAs to have in-person uh, operations are starting in the next, I think the next week, and particularly for arraignments and other type of appearances. All of this movement will certainly, my view is, will move uh, cases. As I said before, I think in-person appearances are essential to the resolution of those cases. And obviously, while we will completely respect as the city, the decisions made by the district attorneys on how to decide how to move on these cases forward, but we will do everything possible to support them a, and provide the resources that they might need. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Brannon. Uh, Director Solo, uh, according to OCA, only 21 jury trials have started this year across all of the city's Supreme Court. We're going to need a lot more than 21 trials to get through the backlog. So what can you tell us about the plan to speed up the process of getting these trials underway? Right. So as I was saying a, during my testimony, we know that trials do not, a, in any given year, trials do not resolve cases. Most cases are resolved, as you know, through the plea process. 
uh, and other uh, uh, decisions. Uh, what we want to make sure, however, is that those trial rooms, as I indicated, are available. So as we increase trial capacity and people are seeing that trials are happening, we believe that will incentivate all parties to address a to address a to come to the table and increase the number of pleas. And that's one of the ways in which we can do a we will address the backlog. With regards to trials, what I will say is the following. As I said, we identify, for instance, just to have mentioned 21 trials. We identify, for instance, very recently, as I mentioned before, that in one of the counties, there was only one trial room operating. Now we know that we have four to five a trial rooms operated in that county. It's the work that we continue to do, in addition to obviously provide the incentives so cases can be pled out and then people have that incentive. But we will also do for sure is to provide all the efforts, that, you know, that all the resources on the city have to increase that trial capacity. That includes that includes also for of course to bring more jurors and to a and to bring that. I know Diana wants to add a one element a, of the plan. She is my deputy in charge of this process and can tell you more specific details about what are the plans of the city in this area. Go ahead, Diana. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to make clear that during the height of the pandemic, what, what the city and OCA worked together to do was to take courtrooms that have historically and pre-pandemic used for trials and use them as grand juries to be able to provide the grand jury rooms to be able to provide the secrecy that grand juries need. However, as we are coming out of the health crisis, we are converting those trial rooms back to their original purpose of trial rooms to expand capacity, working with OCA to identify alternative spaces for grand juries that can still accommodate grand jury members and social distancing. So that is part of the physical interagency operations that we're working with DA's offices, OCA um, and DCAS to try and identify space to make sure that we are expanding capacity as the health conditions become better and we are able to do so safely. Okay, along those lines, Ms. Logan, can you ex expound on that a little bit for us and give us some more insight as far as the grand juries are concerned, where we are, uh, what the plan of restoration of grand jury uh, assembly is, what that's going to look like, how uh, disassembly maybe of the grand jury have uh, contributed to the backlog or to the jail population itself? So overall, we, we know that grand juries, as, as Director Soler explained, need to be in person. And during the height of the pandemic, grand juries were not able to operate. However, all of the system actors worked together to do preliminary hearings when the health conditions allowed, and then move towards having grand juries operating, albeit at a lower level. So we started slowly to make sure that OCA and all of the, the court participants were able to um, adjust to the social distancing, the cleaning routines. DCAS came in and made sure to provide enhanced cleaning measures within the grand jury rooms. And, in it, and ultimately we moved to having at least two grand juries in each borough, uh, with the exception of Staten Island, which has a smaller volume. So they had one grand jury operating. And as we are coming out of the health crisis, each one of the boroughs and OCA are working to expand that. So approximately four grand juries are operating in the different boroughs. But as you have made very clear, and Director Soler has made clear, the actual volume of cases is larger than the current capacity. And as the health conditions allow, the courts are sending out summonses and in, impaneling additional grand juries to be able to move forward with the continued in-person operation of courts. Okay, thank you. Um, and going back to arraignment time um, and arrests, uh, according to the NYPD, the average arrest to arraignment time in May of 2021 was about 21 hours, down from a May 2020 pandemic high of 23 hours and 23 minutes, but still up from the May 2019 average of 18 hours and 27 minutes. That's the average. So a lot of people are in for a lot longer before they actually see a judge, including a lot of people charged with low-level misdemeanors 
and cases that can get dismissed right off the bat. How can we get back to that 2019 number? And do you expect the return to in-person arraignments in the next few weeks to help that uh, move along? Yes, we do. And just to confirm, what we have seen in recent uh, months is an improvement in the key indicators pertaining a average arrest time, arrest to arraignment times, as well as processing times. So as you right now, the number of uh, the average that we have is about 20 hours per arraignment. We still can do better, as you said, and we will continue to work with the courts and we think that certainly in-person operations will do. We know that during the pandemic, a 95% of cases were arraigned within 36 hours and 66%, we, 66% during uh, within 24 hours. Then those numbers, again, have increased. We are now up to 97% in, within 36 hours and 72% within 24 hours, and but what we expect to do is to increase certainly to a situation where 99% of the cases are arraigned within at least 36 hours and 85% of them are arraigned within two, 24 hours, which is what will allow us to be in that position. We certainly believe that in-person arraignments are going to be important. Again, we have a phase schedule and we have agreed with the courts, with the DAs, with the defenders. It's been implemented over the next two or three weeks. We think that's absolutely going to be essential and important. And as you said, primarily for the defenders. And a, certainly, as I stated, we want a safer, but also a fairer system. And part of fairness is to be able to be a speed and a finality to, to the criminal justice when people have cases. Okay. I want to touch on uh, bail just a little bit, and then I'm going to get my colleagues in here. Um, despite bail reform taking effect last January, the rate of bail being set has actually gone up in the last year. Now, I'm sure that a year ago, a lot of judges were more reluctant to send someone to Rikers because of the incredible health risk. So it's understandable that it would have gone up some. But we're now approaching pre-bail reform levels, and that is concerning to me. It's also troubling that more bail is being set in cases that were not affected by bail reform law at all. I know you don't control when bail gets used, but what can you tell us about what you're seeing with respect to how often bail is being set and what impact that may have going forward? So let me let me tell you what we do internally and we'll try to address your question. A, we regularly track, as you said, we do not control bail and we want to stay far away from those decisions. Those decisions belong obviously to the court system. What we do is we track every week very closely the bail trends. A, what we also do is to track very closely the rate at which people are making bail. What we see in particular is that a, with, when it comes to violent felony offenders, a, which is probably what you're seeing, the rates are as you indicated, we don't see exactly the same rates for violent felon, sorry, for felon, non-violent felonies and for misdemeanors. And what we are trying to make sure is that we implement two hour strategies that we think have been quite successful. One is we continue to educate the judges about the importance of our supervised release. As you know, we implement the supervised release and we think it's a very successful program initially for misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies, but right now supervised release is on a strategy that works well also for violent felons. A, there are obviously some limitations, but a, to any program, but a, overall we are working to continue to expand supervised release and we have seen increase in those numbers. And the second is to track very closely the difference between making a, whether or not judges set bail and the ability that people have to make bail. And I think one of the things that we have to be very mindful of is that probably that is the best indicator as to whether or not bail, ref, you know, uh, success with regards to bail reform. Our data indicate that people are making, uh, making bail at a higher rate after they are set bail than before. But I will definitely discuss this further with my team and report back to you on what we see on these trends. A, but a, certainly we are concerned, as you said, about everything 
that might have an impact, an impact in our projections with regards to a close Rikers and our re efforts to reduce incarceration. So certainly Bell is one of the things that we look closely every single week. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and I agree with you. Mach J has done a great job um, of creating programs like supervised relief um, to give judges another option uh, rather than, you know, just setting bail or releasing a defendant on their own recognizance. Is there anything uh, that you may be looking into to give judges another alternative? We know the city has started to use electronic monitoring for the first time recently. Is that something that can possibly be used more often? It, yeah, I will refer to the Analogan, who it runs our electronic monitoring program and can give you the information regarding electronic monitoring. I don't want to provide a well, information. Diana, please, could you address that question? Absolutely. So, yes, Chair, in um, very lightning speed, the city provided electronic monitoring as a tool back in 2020 and rolled it out through the sheriff's department. So the program actually runs out of the Department of Finance and Sheriff Joseph Facito is, and his team runs the actual monitoring of individuals that are assigned to an electronic monitoring uh, device. The program has started to see increases. Uh, during the pandemic, we had um, much stricter rules and protocols for who could be on electronic monitoring. And much of that centered around what was considered a stable home life because of some of the limitations with the technology itself, needing a monitor that was affixed in a home that could read the actual bracelet. As we have gotten more experience with it, the sheriff's team has expanded what they what they are able to do as it relates to making sure they're monitoring individuals that are using additional types of maybe untraditional housing scenarios. And therefore we have seen the program go from into having as few as you know, 10 individuals to now having more than uh, 50 individuals that are participating and the courts have put into the program. We, are, we expect to see some of the courts taking advantage of this tool as well. And, and all of the tools that the city is providing, we make sure that the courts are aware that we do have supervised release, that there is the electronic monitoring, and we stay in constant contact with OCA to determine if there are any other tools and supports that we as a city can provide. Okay, thank you. Are, are, there, are there any um, concerns about um, widening uh, the process for electronic monitoring at all or the use? I'm, I'm sorry, Chair Adams, when you say concerns, can you just be a little clearer? What concerns would you, are you worried about? Um, in, in looking at the process a step further uh, and stretching it out, net widening the process, are there any concerns about net widening? So I, I, be, I think given that the ultimate decision is made by the jurist, meaning the judge, that will sit down and actually write the securing order in terms of what the actual tool is being used for and when and how, what limitations are put on an individual that is being given electronic monitoring as an alternative, that we at this juncture are comfortable that the courts are using the tool in the way that the, is consistent with the law and therefore at this time, there doesn't seem to be an issue with the net widening, as you say, that the courts are using the tools available to them consistent with what the law has said it's to be used for. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I pass it on to my colleagues, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Holden, and I believe I recognized council member Menchaca at the top, but I will recognize council member Menchaca again as well. Uh, it's on you. Okay, I will now call on council members in the order they appear in the Zoom, uh, in, or, in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question, you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your questions and receive an answer from the panelists. 
uh, the sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know that your time is up. Once I've called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced before you, before you begin asking your questions. Um, I believe council member Powers will be up first. Thank you, thank you, Chair Adams and everyone for uh, being here today. Um, I want to just go into a little bit of uh, uh, data around the shootings, of, you know, the sort of surge in shootings over the past year. And we've been doing a lot to try to uncover uh, explanations for that. And one of the narratives or explanations we've heard during the pandemic has been the um, closing of the criminal courts as a reason that could lead to increased shootings. And I think there's been some debate over whether that would be the correct narrative or not. Can This is from the mayor's office of criminal justice. Can you tell us what, if any, impact you believe to examine that narrative just for a bit? If you can tell us any impact you might believe that the closing of the criminal courts would have or has had perhaps on the, the uh, uh, large increase in shootings in the city over the last uh, last calendar year. So as you know, and the mayor has stated several times, we face an increase in shootings that has impacted not just obviously New York City, but the entire country. It's also an exceptional situation where the profound dislocations of the pandemic are impacting. What I can tell you is what I pretty much believe is happening a, and it's important. Deterrence a, matters when we have certainty of enforcement and we have certainty of a prosecution. So a, I think very few people will dispute and you need to have those that thing in place in order to deter individuals. A, Certainly, a, I think that is more the case when it comes to violence than in any other area. And this is why we see increases in gun violence, but we do not see increases in overall crime. The Deterrence, as I said, depends on the certainty of, again, arrest and prosecution. Similarly, there is the need to incapacitate certain folks within certain individuals who are not likely who are likely to hurt a members of the community. And that has also been certainly impacted during the pandemic. A, our ability to, you know, with a system where we have much more limited finality and cases could not move as fast, we, we have some limitations in our ability to incapacitate. I think those two things have changed recently. I think okay. Like, can I just, I, just because I'm using a lot of time here. Yeah, sorry. So just let me just go back to, do, yeah, it's kind of yes or no. Do you believe the closing of the criminal courts has led to an increase in shootings in the city over the last calendar year? I think that there are multiple factors. It's not a yes or no. There are multiple uh, factors. And I well, say, the, the, question, the question is, do you believe it's part of the equation, I guess? If I believe it's part of the equation, the answer is yes. It is one part of the equation that we are looking into for the reason. Okay, that and, and and is that because you believe that the, what I heard is that there's no there's no level of deterrence because there's no finality of the case? I what I believe, as I said, yes, you need to have deterrence in the system and you have to have incapacitation and then you have to have finality. Yes. And for individuals that are caught with a uh, caught in a shooting and arrested, are they um, those individuals would be held in our city jails while they await trial. Is that correct? No. You asked me what answer. The, the answer is depends on the individual. Those are decisions that are made individually by the judge. There are some individuals that will be held. There are some individuals who will not be held. There are some individuals that will receive bail and will make bail. There are other individuals who will be remanded or some people will be released. Okay, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is like how much of the impact this um, uh, closing of the criminal courts has on the shootings. I think the mayor has used that as a explanation, predominant, predominant explanation in many of the uh, instances where he's been asked. It, it strikes me as perhaps a piece of the equation, but it, it's hard to believe that that's the uh, uh, the driving cause of a massive increase in shootings. 
Can you give us some other maybe explanations or other thoughts on what, uh, since I haven't had a chance to ask you this at other hearings, could, perhaps we can give us other thoughts as well in terms of what might be leading the increase in gun violence over the past year? Yes, I think the social and economic dislocations uh, are significant. I think the amount of trauma in the community are significant issues of legitimacy and the ability uh, of people to trust the system, willingness to cooperate with the police department and with government in general. Those are all factors that have contributed, I think, uh, to this. And, uh, and certainly it might be that we see greater potential for interpersonal conflict than we have seen in many decades because of the, conf again, the conditions of the pandemic has impacted us all. We have seen that in shootings, but we have seen in other dynamics uh, where we, so there are multiple theories that we explore and then we are trying to, uh, you know, to provide evidence for. We believe the court certainly functioning is important. A functioning a court system is important to provide the deterrence and incapacitation that I mentioned is part of the equation. How much, what percentage, I cannot tell you right now, but it is part of the equation. Okay, I'll just, uh, my time is run out, but I'll just ask one more question. I, I did see a chart that uh, Mach J put out, I think it was last year, sort of showing timeline and the increase of shootings and some events that had happened um, at the same time, in terms of when COVID hit, things like that. Um, have you provided, has the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice issued any sort of updated information or data sets that might help the uh, uh, council, the public, the press, understand uh, factors leading uh, or, or um, factors contributing to it, or whether it's arrest data or um, other data that might help uh, uh, you know, the public perhaps. I mean, I think just we have a, we're seeing a lot of, we're in the, everybody's reading the newspapers and we're getting lots of questions about what's happening here. We talk about impact of laws, the closing of criminal court, destabilization of uh, COVID. We hear a lot of different theories is there anything the mayor's office has put out, criminal justice put out that discusses what is happening right now in the city and provides any data to support any theories of what's, why we're seeing a surge? The answer is yes, we will share with you some of the updated information that we have posted. Okay, all right. Thank you, thanks Chair Adams. Yep. Thank you, Council Member Powers. We'll now turn to Council Member Holden, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you all for your testimony. Um, I just have a question um, to follow up uh, on electronic monitoring that the Chair asked. Um, uh, when me meeting with the Queens DA, and I, I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm not going to put words in her mouth, but because um, I, I mentioned the same thing about electronic monitoring, couldn't that be expanded? And it seems like the process is that the suspect, let's say the person's arrested, they before their court case, or they that they had they 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 go home, and then they have to come back for to put the uh, once they get approval for electronic monitoring, they have to come back. Is that the process where there's a there's a there's a space in there? Is it there's a time element? It's not done in the courts right away. It's not done on the day of the arraignment. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Council Member right. Holden, it's Deanna Logan. Right. Uh, so especially during the height of the pandemic, what happened was a the, the type of electronic monitoring was only the what people colloquially refer to as house arrest, meaning that the person was going to be in a home with the bracelet and therefore they wouldn't be able to leave that location. In those cases, individuals were remanded, held in custody, and then the sheriff's team would go and perform whatever the interview was to determine whether the individual was somebody that had the ability to be monitored. Thereafter, the, uh, they would report back to the courts and then the courts would make a determination whether or not they agreed that this individual should actually be put on electronic monitoring. Currently, the same type of analysis is done, 
but obviously the court, depending on the charge, has the ability to remand the person for interview or to let the person remain at liberty and report to the sheriff's office or have a virtual interview with the sheriff's office to have the final determination and, and information sent to the court as to whether or not the court really wants to use that tool for that individual. But, but do you see like um, a better way to do it? Do you, do you see that maybe this could be done in like one at the, at the court right away and have the electronic monitor in the court? Um, where, like there's an office there where you don't have to, we don't have to have a lull or a few days with figuring this all out. Absolutely. And as the, again, health crisis subsides and there is the ability to have more in-person then we will work with OCA to make sure that we can do that. Right now, space in the courthouses is limited and therefore the ability for the sheriff and his team to kind of set up shop within the courthouse has been also limited. Okay, um, one other question on um, the shootings that uh, chair, that um, was brought up by uh, Council Member Powers. Um, when I met with the police commissioner, this was um, some weeks ago, uh, they said that they're making the arrest. NYPD is making the arrest, but only, I think it was last year, 12% of the suspects caught in, in a shooting went to jail. And I think this year it's up to 17%. So given New York City's gun, you know, tough gun laws, and I, I could, you know, this could go to Mock J or it can go to um, anybody in the DA's office uh, that are there, that are on this. But it seems to me that that's a low number. So, so we're, are we arresting the same people who are committing these uh, shootings? Um, and if only 17% are so far this year are going to jail, that seems to be a problem. So uh, is it, how, what, does anybody have a, a, a more updated number of how many people are actually incarcerated, uh, held after a shooting, after they're caught with a gun or in a shooting? So I, all right. So I, I'm not sure exactly what information the police department provided. I can tell you the information that we have. I can tell you that the number of people who are in, the number of people in Rikers in in the jail system for murder and attempted murder are up by forty eight percent. A, over the last a, over the last year, I can tell you that a the number of people a for gun possession is also up a about that a forty six percent I think is the correct number. So certainly I understand a what the police commissioner was indicating. I have not, but a again we as we I, in my answer to Chair Adams the decisions. That, time yeah it's, uh, it's freezing you're freezing up is yeah. it, do i see everybody see that or do i just see that no no i, I we i think we're all seeing that you're yeah we, your, we um, missed your uh, yeah we missed your answer uh so sorry so can you can you hear me now yeah all right so what i was saying is that uh, the information the data that i have is and um, murders a people accused defendants for murder in Rikers in jail are up. A no, but I'm, I'm the question. No, but I'm asking you not about murders or attempted murder. I'm asking you about. I'm in. Let's say I, I fire a gun. I don't hit anybody, but I'm firing a gun. What's percentage of those guys or those people that go to jail when you shoot a gun in New York City? A the, the problem with your question. In other, your your question is wrong. They, what I'm saying is then we well we don't charge people for shooting. We charge people for either a murder. We charge people for an attempt murder, an attempted murder. We charge people with an assault one. We charge well, people reckless for endangerment, the whatever, whatever charges are are but, charged or go along with firing a gun in New York City. That was the question. Like, what what percentage a, of those people are going to jail? Because what, according to the police department, it's a very low number. I, I will follow up with the police department. Okay. The numbers, the information that I have, is in one I stated. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Next up is Councilmember Rosenthal. 
Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I, I guess my question is sort of first, uh, just to sort of observe, observe the previous questions and what people are searching for is um, comprehensive data that can help us get to um, better uh, public laws or policy. I'm wondering if you all are hearing that as well and uh, what your timing is on getting out the reports that would answer some of these questions. So what I said is some of these reports are already online. Um, I'm, we have released them through the, um, for the last year and most recently, but if there are additional data, we will definitely, uh, we are always planning. I, we will, uh, we update data regularly. I, I will check with my team. I'll get back to your office to tell you exactly yeah. when is the next report on this issue. I, I remember guess. that we released nothing two or three months ago, but I don't remember right now. When well, is the, the next point one? just being that, mm -hmm. um, you know, politicians, the NYPD, uh, interested parties are using disparate information or no data to assert things that may or may not be true. And your office could play a critical role, right? So, you know, to Bob Holden's point, wouldn't it be great if we could have some dispositive information answering his concern, which is about people shooting guns and whether or not the criminal justice system is interacting with them or any system is interacting with them in some way. Um, in my district, it's less about shootings. It's more about people who are repeatedly let out um, because there's nothing to keep them on and then causing um, some physical harm to someone. You know, if we could have real data about that and not just one-off examples, um, as policymakers, we could all have better answers. So my question is more centered around a plea for accurate data um, because otherwise uh, people are rushing to judgment based on limited information and it's too important of an issue in a time to drop the ball on that. I mean, so, so with that, trying to ask a question, are, are there any barriers to getting information from your office? Are you able to see court data? Are you able to track somebody from arrest to outcome, um, so, stuff like that? So we do not have a significant barriers. What we do is, uh, for instance, to your point, we the last report that I was referring about two months ago was data pertaining re-arrest. That's a report that we have to wait for two months. I think it's very informative for what the kind of information for the kind of the information you're looking for. Uh, but we need to wait about a couple of months, yes, because the data is coming. We need to process it and we need to put it out there. And the right. system in, in, this, in the data is not constantly updated. Uh, so I agree with you. Data that will allow us to know about gun violence, but also about other felonies and non-violent uh, non felonies. So uh, I will check with my team. I will. I mean, wouldn't it be I great to if push, at but this don't... hearing yeah. you could give some dispositive numbers? Right. What percentage of people who have been let out 10 times have now committed, uh, I guess it's called a felony assault, I'm not a lawyer. You know, how many, mm -hmm. you know, what percentage of the felony assaults are done by people who've been let out repeatedly, et cetera. I wish you were able at a hearing like this. And, and of course with shootings, I just, represent the Upper West Side where we're not right. having that issue. But, you know, the same with shootings. Like, y'all should be able to 
have this information readily available. So the mayor's talking about it, obviously, too. So I, so I can, uh, I can tell you that the rearrest rate, the rearrest rates in in the city, are remarkably stable and have been as remarkably stable in in recent months. A about thirty six, about thirty percent of people who have a who are involved in the criminal justice system are rearrested at some point within a year. A Right and now, is that we are different seeing, than before bail reform? No, we, we don't see substantial So there's no change. So when there my is no police officers, no, there is, when my there, NYPD, Chair, with your permission, just one more quick yeah. second. Um, when my NYPD says at the police council meetings um, that uh, the reason there's so much, so uh, many people punching people on the street is because people are just let out over and over and over again so they can't do anything about it. What's what should they be saying? Hey, I don't I don't know what the PD should be saying. What I am saying is uh, the data is much more complex obviously than I presented. The overall numbers do not change. There are changes within categories and we can discuss and I will contact your office and everybody else who wants and make and most importantly we put this data publicly to make it available and show in what categories things are different than they were before and which categories they things have not changed but a uh, overall okay. yeah mm -hmm. sorry go ahead no overall in our when we analyze this data and as i said we look regularly the rearrest data indicates that a numbers have not changed drastically in the last 18 months that's incredibly important information. I hope it is shared with the precincts. And, it's, uh, and you have a report publicly on my website. If you go to the website, you will see a report already on rate of rise information, both historically and what has happened most recently. Yeah, yeah. I, I urge the NYPD, if you're listening to this, to share that information with your local precincts. Thank yeah. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. I'll give um, any other remaining council members just a minute in case they want to use the Zoom raise hand function. And after that, we will move on to the next panel. Acknowledging that we've been joined by council members Gibson and Cabrera. Okay, seeing no hands, so I'll proceed slowly. Um, thank you very much to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. We'll now turn to, uh, to Richmond County District Attorney Michael McMahon. Thank you so very much, Chair Adams and all the members of the committee. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to um, administer the oath. Uh, District Attorney McMahon, could you please raise your right hand? And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, you may begin your testimony. Thank you, is my volume okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Good, all right. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an honor uh, to once again be, be before the New York City Council, uh, in particular, uh, the Committee on Public Safety and you, Chairwoman uh, Adams. Uh, and to all fellow members, I want to thank Council Members Miller, Powers, Menchaca, Rosenthal, Brannon, Holden, Gibson, and Cabrera uh, for joining us today. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank uh, the delegation from Staten Island, led by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Council Member Debbie Rose, and Council Member Joe Borelli for all the work that they do advocating for the people of Richmond County. Uh, I know you, many of you heard it too often, but as an alum of the New York City Council, uh, I'm honored uh, to be with you and thank you for all the great that, work that you do. I also wanna thank our partners, uh, those uh, 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 from uh, MACCHE, uh, certainly uh, Marcus and Deanna for the work that they've done to help us get through the COVID crisis uh, and our partners in delivering justice for the people of Staten Island, the city of New York, uh, the Defense Bar, uh, Legal Aid, the, the public defenders, uh, the private uh, attorneys and of course the ATV council uh, as well. Uh, when I last uh, appeared before this council, we were just getting ready to relaunch the first trials again uh, in Richmond County Supreme Court since the onset of the pandemic. 
And today I can report that we have safely completed three felony trials to verdict and a fourth trial was resolved with a plea during jury selection and a fifth a murder trial uh, is currently underway. So we are, uh, to answer the question uh, posed by the hearing notice uh, in the state of the courts, we are getting away at the Supreme uh, Court level. Uh, this was fraught with logistical challenges brought by COVID and its safety precautions, and this was no easy feat. Uh, but with determination and collaboration between those many partners that I mentioned uh, and OCA, although I'm with you, Chairwoman Adams, they should have come to this hearing today, uh, and most notably a willing public uh, and those intrepid uh, jurors and grand jurors who showed up to fulfill their uh, civic duty. Uh, we are slowly making progress and, and, and this is all made possible by them. Um, that said, trials have yet to resume in uh, the Richmond County Criminal Court. Uh, in criminal court, we continue to work with our partners in OCA and the defense bar to resolve as many cases possible in the pretrial phase. But it, to be sure, there are certain cases that do need uh, to proceed to trial, and that's not happening currently. And as we know, there's a new state legislation that says in New York City, uh, uh, B, B misdemeanor cases and unspecified misdemeanor cases will have to have a trial as well. So that clock continues to exist. Uh, like other counties, we have seen an uptick in the backlog of cases and BATs in criminal court in this pandemic, and it presents a difficult task for our office, the court and the defense bar to work through this in the months ahead. For the DA offices across the city, the challenge of meeting discovery obligations on the unrealistic timeline set by the state legislature in 2019 in the criminal justice reform laws amid a surge in violent shooting and homicide cases while also balancing the ballooning backlog of cases is indeed daunting. The resumption of trials and the full functioning of the courts is the only way to clear some of this backlog. It's not the only way, but it's, part, it's, it's an important way. And it will take time and resources, particularly personnel resources, to be accomplished fully. As we face the obstacles ahead, our biggest challenge is a fiscal one created by the administration and the council and it threatens us with dozens of layoffs and at the worst possible at this worst possible juncture and to be sure without financial relief we cannot meet our criminal justice obligations and let me explain at the end of 2019 the city gave the five da's offices and the special narcotics prosecutor money to hire staff and build the infrastructure needed to respond to the new criminal justice reform mandates passed in albany that went into effect in January 2020. The administration and the council approved and instructed our office to hire expeditiously 61 new positions to meet these demands. At the time, these positions were funded on a pro rata basis uh, for fiscal year 20, and in other words, seven months instead of 12 months uh, for these salaries. It was promised that in the fiscal year 21 adopted, these positions would be fully funded, assuming that we filled the spots by that time. By the spring of 2020, we had hired over 95% of these positions, yet the full funding never promised was delivered. We were told it would come in the adopted, then the November plan, the January plan, and it still never happened. And there's no question that if you believe in criminal justice reform, that these new uh, positions are vital for our agency to fulfill the mandated obligations under the new criminal justice reforms. In fact, in an effort to provide responsible good faith projections as to our needs, we may have underestimated them. But I'm not here to argue with that today. We just want to remind this council that we will not be able to function on the promise of criminal justice reform without help. Over the past year, our office has had to delay start dates, implementing a hiring freeze, and accumulate a significant number of vacancies to avoid layoffs. And looking forward to fiscal year 22, we face a significant uh, personnel budget, a PS budget deficit of approximately a million and a half dollars because of this unfulfilled uh, promise in funds. Without the funding, we will have layoffs amidst a time of uh, budget uh, increases for the city of New York at a time of great concern about safety on our streets. This depletion in personnel will have a devastating impact on our ability to address case backlog, to meet the discovery mandates of the new criminal justice reforms, 
and all at a time when we are battling a surge in violent crimes, as we have heard through the questioning of many of your colleagues, Madam Chairwoman, uh, and violent crimes and emerging from the COVID pandemic. Put simply, we cannot continue down this road and ensure public safety in Staten Island if this funding crisis remains unaddressed. And it's not Staten Island only, it is the other four offices and the SMP. I implore the council to help our office and all of the prosecutorial offices fulfill the mission we are entrusted to do for our communities and right the wrong in this fiscal year adopted budget. I'd like to now just give you an overview of where we are in our, our court processes and our numbers. Our grand juries resumed in August 2020 before they were paused due to an uptick in COVID cases. They resumed in January and we have been operational since. As you heard, we operate one grand jury at a time here in Staten Island. As I mentioned, Supreme Court trials resumed in 2021, April 2021. All court personnel returned to the courthouse in late May. And currently, as I said, the criminal court inventory in Richmond County is just below 1,700 cases. And there are an additional 800 to 900 unarranged, unarranged DATs not reflected in that number. Although at one point during the pandemic, the criminal court inventory of cases uh, that were pending over a year had ballooned to over uh, 200 cases, we have worked with the defense bar and the court to bring that number down to about 130. This is despite not having trials resuming criminal court yet, as I've mentioned. There is no tentative plan that we are aware of for trials to resume in criminal court at this time, but our ADAs are all preparing their cases and managing their caseloads as if hearings and trials are moving forward. Our office has worked hard to maintain low arrest to arraignment times, even amid the pandemic. In April, 2021, our average arrest to arraignment time was 14.51 hours. Uh, 14 hours, 51 minutes, bringing our annual average to just over 16 hours. When I came into office in 2016, Staten Island had one of the worst uh, numbers at over to, uh, 21 hours, and we've consistently brought that down. And it's something that we're extremely proud of, even uh, amidst the COVID crisis. We have been told that OCA is committed to making virtual appearances a fixture of court proceedings where appropriate, some of this depends on future executive orders by the governor and modifications to the criminal procedure law. The court has begun in-person appearances for unarranged DATs on June 1st. Defendants are notified to appear in person in the arraignment part. And our arraignment judge has been calling approximately 25 unarranged DATs per day. This includes the DATs that have come in during the pandemic as well as all DATs on the warrants calendar. So as we sit before you today, over a year into readjusting our world to fight a dangerous global pandemic, it goes without saying that this time has been filled with challenges and setbacks. Despite these difficult times, however, I am proud that my office was able to adapt and persevere. We've re remained vigilant in our dedication to the rule of law, the protection of victims of crime. Excuse me, Mr. McMahon. Yes. We need to pause for one moment. We're having some technical difficulties. Would you mind just pausing for one moment? Sure. Thank you. How are we looking, guys? Everyone's got tight schedules. <laughs> 